When we talk about telescopes, we almost always think about visible light telescopes exclusively. And yet, there is a wide spectral range of wavelengths that we wish to be able to understand the universe with. However, as you can see in this image, there are very few wavelengths that actually make it all the way to the ground here on Earth. So in order for us to understand how these different types of telescopes work, it's useful to talk about them in terms of the wavelengths that they're sensitive to. If we begin with the radio portion of the spectrum, it makes perfect sense to just go ahead and set up a radio dish on the ground because the Earth's atmosphere is transparent to radio wavelengths. And so we build radio dishes like this one. This is the Green Bank Radio Telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. It is the world's largest steerable telescopes. We actually have larger radio telescopes, but they are fixed on the ground and they only can look in one portion of the sky. This one is the largest telescope that can be fully steered around. So the first thing that you notice about this telescope is that it's big. It's very big. It's 100 meters in diameter. But that's necessary because the wavelengths that we're observing with are so long. Remember the relationship between wavelength and angular resolution and the aperture. The longer the wavelength, the lower your angular resolution unless you make your aperture larger. So let's imagine that we're using the Green Bank Telescope to observe at one meter wavelength radio waves. That gives us a resolution of just 2,000 arc seconds. Now remember, for comparison, the human eye is sensitive to approximately 20 arc seconds. So this is a considerably lower angular resolution. Well, what would a radio image look like? Well, it would look like this. Uh, the blue blob that you see at the center, that is the Andromeda galaxy. And the red blobs are that which the Green Bank Telescope sees. For some additional visible reference, uh, there is the full moon shown there. And these glowing red blobs uh, radiate at a radio wavelength of 21 centimeters. So that means that the angular resolution that Green Bank achieves at this wavelength is about 525 arc seconds. It's still much, much lower resolution than the human eye. So now you might be thinking, well, why do we even bother with radio waves? I mean, they're so long, we cannot get very good angular resolution. Well, that's true, but keep in mind the relationship between wavelength and temperature. Wien's law tells us that the longer the wavelength, the cooler the temperature. So what this allows us to do is detect very cool interstellar, or in this case, intergalactic gas. And it's this gas that serves as the building blocks of future stars and planets. So in order for us to understand where these raw materials are distributed, we need to observe at radio wavelengths. Now the blue disk in the middle is the Andromeda galaxy itself. It is also a radio image, but it's a much higher resolution radio image than the Green Bank Telescope. So how was this image achieved? Well, this was made by the Westerbrook Synthesis Radio Telescope. And it is, as you can see, an array of telescopes that work together to act as a single radio telescope of a much larger aperture. These telescopes employ a technique called interferometry, and it works like this. Imagine we have two telescopes that are separated by about a kilometer apart. Well, they're both going to be detecting radio waves from the sky, both from the same source, and they're both going to be sending their resulting signals toward a central computer. Now, when these two signals arrive, they can arrive in one of two ways. If the signals are arriving in such a way that the wave peaks are opposite the other signal's wave peaks, and the wave troughs are opposite the other signal's wave troughs, we say that these signals are 180 degrees out of phase with one another. In other words, they are canceling each other out, and the end result is no signal. It's as if though we didn't have a telescope at all. On the other hand, if we adjust the signals such that the signals are now what we call in phase, then the wave peaks and the wave troughs add up together. So they constructively interfere with one another, thus literally boosting the signal. So in this 
sense, we get the equivalent of a one kilometer diameter aperture telescope. Now, the largest radio interferometer is the Very Large Array, and it consists of 27 telescopes that each of which are alone 25 meters in aperture. And these telescopes are mounted on rails, and they can be extended and expanded or brought in close together. And in doing so, there are trade-offs that are being made. The array is set up in a Y-shaped pattern, and the telescope dishes themselves are on rails, so they can be spread out farther apart in order to, to achieve a high resolution, or they can be brought closer together in order to better concentrate the radio waves and get the equivalent of a brighter image. Now, if a very large array looks familiar to you, you may have seen it in the movies. It was featured prominently in the movie Contact, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, probably because it features an astronomer as the hero, the way it should be. So let's talk now about the microwave part of the spectrum. As you can see, most of the microwave region is blocked by the Earth's atmosphere, and that's largely due to water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere. So to do microwave astronomy from Earth, you need to set your telescopes in a high desert situation like this one. This is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. It's located in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which is a high desert, about uh, 6,000 feet above sea level, and the air above Atacama is extremely dry. Now this uses 66 antennas, and this achieves the equivalent of a 16 kilometer aperture. So now we're able to look at, for example, this. This is the warm dust and the warm gas surrounding a newly forming star. But you notice these cutouts in the gas. Uh, you notice that there are these rings that they're arranged into. Well, that's because there are planets that have formed around the star that are carving out uh, lanes in the disk surrounding the newly forming star. So we can study how planetary systems form using millimeter wave uh, telescopes like these. Now, when it comes to observing at infrared, it's a mixed bag. You can see from this diagram that the Earth's atmosphere is mostly transparent to some of the infrared wavelengths or the near infrared part of the spectrum, whereas the far infrared is completely blocked by Earth's atmosphere. So we have to use a variety of techniques to get around this problem. One technique, of course, is to build ground-based telescopes and locate them above as much of the Earth's atmosphere and as much of the water vapor in the Earth's atmosphere as possible. This is one of those telescopes. This was opened in 1979. It's NASA's Infrared Telescope Facility, uh, located atop Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's capable of detecting in the near infrared. It's a modest, I think about a three meter diameter aperture, uh, which is uh, not very large by modern standards. And on the right, you see an image of Jupiter and you can make out some of the details and the lighter the color, the warmer those regions of Jupiter are. Now, all modern telescopes are sensitive to both optical or visible and near-infrared wavelengths. So effectively, every modern telescope is kind of like a near-infrared telescope as well. But to get a little bit farther into the infrared, you need to get above even more of the water vapor. And so that's why this telescope is located in the back of a modified 747. This is SOFIA, or the Stratospheric Observatory for Infrared Astronomy. Now, it's a 2.5 meter telescope, so it's, again, fairly modest, but because it is able to fly above 99% of the water vapor in the atmosphere, it can see deeper into the infrared. And best of all, because it's in an airplane, it can be deployed to the southern hemisphere to conduct observations of that part of the sky or farther north to catch uh, more of what's going on in the northern hemisphere. So it's an infrared telescope that can be located anywhere on demand, which is a really, really nice capability to have. But if you really want to get into the far infrared, then you need to switch to space-based telescopes. So this is a Spitzer Space Telescope, and there have been several infrared telescopes flown over the years, 
Uh, this is currently the state of the art, although we have a new infrared telescope that's currently uh, being built and is due to launch in the coming years. But Spitzer has been the workhorse of infrared astronomy. Now, the thing about infrared telescopes is that you've got to keep them extremely cold. After all, you are detecting the heat signatures from distant objects. Therefore, you've got to keep the heat signature of the telescope down to the barest minimum. That means that the telescopes have to be equipped with cryogenic coolers, and those coolers have to be fueled by liquid nitrogen and other uh, cryogenics to keep them as cold as possible. Now, the problem with cryogenics is that the liquid coolant runs out. It warms up after a while, and that's why in 2009, uh, the Spitzer telescope ran out of its cryogenic coolant, and it is now uh, no longer sensitive to the farthest parts of the infrared spectrum. Uh, it's warmed up. So it's still a lot colder than anything you and I would consider to be normal. Nevertheless, uh, Spitzer is no longer able to do the primary science mission, but it's still able to do infrared observations of relatively bright infrared objects. Now, we've already spoken about some of the different design techniques that we use to build different types of optical telescopes for different purposes. One of the techniques that we haven't discussed yet is optical interferometry, and it operates on the exact same principle as interferometry for radio telescopes. Namely, we're taking two telescopes and we're separating them by a baseline, and we're using them to act as the equivalent of a larger aperture telescope. So the Kex 1 and 2 telescopes were designed to be operated as an interferometer. Now, light waves are 8 powers of 10 shorter than radio waves. And this means that optical interferometry is much more difficult to do than radio interferometry. And so, for now at least, shorter baselines are required. We cannot spread these telescopes as far apart as we can with radio telescopes. Still, the Keck telescopes were the first optical interferometry telescopes that were uh, commissioned in the early 1990s. And since then, we've made advances in optical interferometry. So the Very Large Telescope uses eight telescopes, uh, four 8-meter telescopes and four 1.8-meter telescopes. So you can see all eight of these telescopes here in this image. And so these telescopes can be combined using optical interferometry to act as a larger telescope. We've also talked about adaptive optics, how we can deform mirrors on telescopes to correct for the changes in the Earth's atmosphere and cancel out the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere in real time. This is an image of a newly forming star that was captured by the Gemini telescope. It's making use of adaptive optics and it has an 8.2 meter aperture mirror. And you can see a lot of detail. This hourglass shape represent lobes of gas that are being blasted out into space by a newly forming star deep in the center of this image. So that is how Gemini sees this. But let's now compare this image to the same object captured by the Hubble Space Telescope. Now the Hubble Space Telescope has an aperture of only 2.4 meters. So how is it that Hubble is able to achieve such a higher angular resolution than Gemini? Well, the answer is simple. It, the Hubble Space Telescope is in space. And this means that there is no atmosphere and no need for adaptive optics or any other kinds of workarounds. By virtue of being above the Earth's atmosphere, Hubble is able to see the universe basically at its diffraction limit. So we can run a simple calculation here to see just how sharp Hubble's images can get, and they get very sharp. They get down to about 0.047 arc seconds. That's an extremely high angular resolution that not even the best telescopes with adaptive optics can achieve here on the surface, at least at visible light wavelengths. So bottom line is that when there's no atmosphere, then you're free to resolve images all the way down to the theoretical best angular resolution, or what we call the diffraction limit. Now, when it comes to wavelengths that are even shorter than visible light, your only option is to go into space. And to talk briefly about some of these shorter wavelengths, 
uh, we'll look at the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Now this telescope has a rather interesting configuration. You see those rings in the front of the telescope? Well, those rings are the telescope's mirrors. If we were just to think about X-rays shining on a normal mirror, well, those X-rays would then just stop dead in their tracks inside the mirror. So what Chandra does is it uses a, a system of rings. Uh, these are mirrors, but they're arranged in rings, and they will take the X-rays and allow the X-rays to just gently graze or deflect off their surfaces, arriving at the detector about 10 meters behind the mirrors, bringing them to a focus. So this is how we can generate X-ray images of the universe. So what is it like to see the universe at all of these different wavelengths? Well, here's the Andromeda galaxy once again. This is a visible light image. Let's remind ourselves of what it looks like in radio. So now we can see where all of that very cold primordial gas and dust is located surrounding the Andromeda galaxy. And remember, this gas and dust will someday be heated up to form stars. When we switch to infrared, courtesy of the Spitzer Space Telescope, the resolution improves, but now we can make out the warm gas and dust. Again, this indicates the fields in, in which stars will eventually form within the disk of the galaxy. If we switch to the ultraviolet part of the spectrum, taken by the Galaxy Evolution Explorer, now we're seeing the locations of very hot, newly formed stars. So this shows where the new stars are forming in Andromeda, and as you can see, they're mostly forming within the spiral arms of the galaxy. But if we peer into the X-ray portion of the spectrum, particularly in this case around the nucleus of the galaxy, we see these blobs, and these blobs are X-ray sources, which are caused by material that is falling into black holes. So these blobs tell us where the black holes are located. So by now it should be apparent that there is no such thing as the best telescope. There are only best telescopes depending upon what part of the electromagnetic spectrum you would like to observe in. Now that being said, you might be thinking, well, sure, but why even bother locating optical telescopes on the ground when we can launch them into space and get the very best angular resolution? Well, remember that telescopes in space are spacecraft. That makes them very expensive to build, and launching them is not cheap either. Uh, they, they can be very expensive to get into a rocket and launched into space. Speaking of rockets, rockets have limitations as to the size or the volume that they can carry, as well as the amount of mass or the weight that they can lift into space. So whatever telescope you're planning to send into space, it cannot be arbitrarily large or arbitrarily heavy. It's got to be small enough and light enough to fit inside of the launch vehicle. By contrast, on the ground, we don't have to really worry too much about the weight as long as we have uh, the location and the budget to support it. Also remember that space is a very unforgiving environment. The telescopes up there are going to be subject to radiation, cosmic rays. They're going to get impacted by micrometeorites, and they're going to be subjected to extreme temperatures. So much of that mass that you're lo launching into space has to be used to protect the spacecraft from the outside environment. So you're now trading science capabilities for survivability, and that's something that you don't have to worry about on the ground too much. Now once the telescope is launched into space, that's it. It had better work. Uh, telescopes in space cannot be upgraded, they cannot be repaired uh, like they can be serviced on the ground. Now, there is the exception, the Hubble Space Telescope is unique in that it was designed to be serviced and updated uh, by manned flights aboard the space shuttle. And indeed it was several times over the course of the last 20 years. The catch, however, is that it required the space shuttle and we no longer fly the space shuttle. Therefore, Hubble has no opportunities or there are no avenues available to upgrade Hubble, and certainly no ability to upgrade Spitzer or any of the other telescopes that we are flying in space. 
So once you launch them, you better hope that they work or you're going to have to come up with some workarounds if at all possible. Something else to consider as well is that these telescopes take a long time to develop. They can take at least 20 years, often longer, to go from idea or from proposal to launch. And that means that once you build them, by the time they actually get into the rocket and launched into space, they are obsolete. Now, we'd love to put the latest and greatest technologies into space, but you got to remember that it takes an awful lot of work to get these telescopes ready for launch. That means that by the time they get through all of the testing and by the time they get through all of the hurdles necessary to launch it into space, uh, that technology has been frozen in time. So, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope launched in 1990, and it was flying with vintage 70s technology. Uh, again, thankfully, Hubble had the ability to be upgraded over time, but you are accepting a certain amount of obsolescence by the time you launch. So, when it comes to observing the universe, and there is no best telescope. There are only best telescopes depending upon the wavelength at which you wish to observe.